Hi, I'm Dave Kinney. I'm Rob Sass, and we're here in Monterey. It's Wednesday, none of the auctions have gotten underway yet, and we're gonna take a sneak preview of what they have at RM. Let's see what goes on behind the curtain here at, uh, at RM. Let's go. All right, Dave, this is not your run-of-the-mill Hudson. This is a Hudson Italia. I believe about 26 of these were built on top of a pretty humble Hudson Jet chassis. What's, uh, what, what makes this car stand out to you? They were built by Touring, an Italian uh, coach builder, and the, uh, the coachwork is super leggero, which is super lightweight. Um, they only made a handful of these cars. Yeah, this is like a dream car, like you see, uh, they, they make these cars to promote their everyday cars. And this was a very special car, great styling, just over the top 50 stuff. And more and more we see these cars in their original colors and well restored just like this one. Yep, speaking of the original colors, they were all this cream and red with cream color scheme, right Dave? I think so, yep. and uh, they were all, uh, you know, they were hard to get one new, but uh, uh, like everything else, they went through a period of time in the 60s and 70s, languished, you didn't see many of them, and they certainly weren't restored. Now we're seeing these cars, and the estimates, uh, the pre-sale estimate on this car was about 250 to 350 on uh, this one, yeah. Huge money, uh, but uh, when you look at the cost of a restoration or something like this, you can see why. These were the cars that the companies built to sell their regular production cars. Yep, and in a few minutes, we're gonna take a look and walk over and see a regular production Hudson in the same time period. Doc Hudson himself. Doc Hudson, a, a fabulous Hudson Hornet. There you go. All right, so here we are, Dave, the fabulous Hudson Hornet. I've always been a huge fan of these American independents from the 50s, and this car really stands out with the step-down body design, the twin H power. These cars were just about unbeatable NASCAR in the early 50s. What are your thoughts? Yeah, it's, it's amazing when you think about it, but these cars, as six cylinders, were, were class winners. They were yeah. really, really a desirable car to have in NASCAR, and even in pre-NASCAR days. And they had a lot of style, and a lot of, uh, you know, kind of new innovations in them. This step-down thing was basically putting the floorboards between the uh, areas of the of the chassis, making it so you walked in but stepped down a little bit, yeah. which was like, hey, this is new stuff. Other manufacturers had it, but it was, you know, it was Hudson's basically their yeah, trademark. Yeah, Hudson actually licensed it to them, but, you know, it gave these cars a lower center of gravity, so they handled better, and they're really pretty good on the track, and until the modern overhead valve V8s in the middle 50s, these things were about the most powerful things on the road. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of car for the money. They were, uh, they performed as well as some of the uh, more expensive luxury cars. And the cool part about this is that you don't see the four doors. You know, what you see are the restored convertibles, of which there are very, very few, but you don't see a restored, uh, you know, version of this car too often, and you don't see them too often at auctions, and this is a high-end auction with kind of a popularly priced car. So that's kind of cool. Well, Dave, everybody loves a Woody, but you always see the Fords and the Chevys. Here, we've got a Mercury and we've got a Packard Woody. Let's talk about those. And also a Ford Woody, we've got the Sportsman, which is one of the rarest Woodies yep. of all. So when you're looking at Woodies, what you do is you look at the continuity of the wood, kind of the quality of it. You look at the seams. Yep. You also make sure that all the colors are the same in it. So, uh, you know, it's one of those cars very much part of American culture, although not all Woodies are American. There certainly are British Woodies, there are Woodies from other countries, but uh, we're kind of famous for them. Uh, surfers made them famous in the uh, 60s because they were so cheap to own. You'd buy these things for less than $1,000 all day long in nobody, the 60s, right? Nobody wanted them because yeah. the wood bodies are very, very difficult to fix. It's almost like a, a fine piece of furniture. You've got these dovetail joints and the grains of the pieces of wood all batch. Really looks very, very intricate. And uh, Woody's have become very, very popular. They're a great collector car, um, fun to own, fun to drive. Uh, usually, most of the ones that you see are going to be six-cylinder, but there's quite a few eight-cylinder ones as well. Uh, the eight-cylinder ones almost always bring more than the same thing in a six-cylinder version. Uh, and you can buy your quality of restoration. Some of these restorations are hundred and two hundred thousand dollar restorations. Some of them are done kind of quasi-professionally. All the cars here look very, very nice. However, yep. these are all professional restorations. Perfect thing to have at the lake house. There you go, but first you need a lake house, so that's problems. So one of the new trends that I really appreciate is the fact that people are going back to the period colors that these cars came in when they were new. I mean, so many 1980s restorations, you know, you would see a period red, color lost, black, red, black, black, yeah, silver, white, you know, resale red especially. This is a Lamborghini Mura, and it's in its original color. I think this was called Verde Floro, which I think translates to fluorescent green. and. You know, it's just the right color for this car in this period. 
Yeah, and uh, these cars came in these wild colors. You could get basically their version of Grabber Blue, and they had pretty much the same palette you might find on yeah. Mopar cars of the same era. Yours look great in orange. This particular car, it's a P400, which mm -hmm. is the first series. Second series was called the Mira S, and then there was the Mira SV. This one has been updated with SV specs. It was done by uh, Bob Wallace, yep. Mark Specialist, very well respected. So it, it, it brings it up above what a, maybe a normal P400 is going to sell for, uh, but not quite as much as what an SV would sell for. SVs are basically million dollar cars now. The reason for that is they have a split sub. In the earlier cars, the gearbox and the transaxle shared the same oil supply. Not a really great idea from an engineering standpoint. They fixed that with most of the SVs. Yeah, um, and it was uh, not every SV has a split sump, but most of them do, uh, from what I understand, uh, you know, is available both ways. There were European versions of these cars, there were American versions of these cars, but interestingly, it's one of these cars that almost every car was different. Very small manufacturer Lamborghini. This was one of their, uh, you know, one of their very early efforts, and so you know, it wasn't like a, a, a production line car. Yep. Things things changed during the time of production. One of the most painfully beautiful cars to me. I, if I had one, I would have to knock a hole in my living room and drive it in the yep. living room. I wouldn't want it in the garage. Also one of the most painfully user cool cars, though, from a standpoint of there's just nothing practical about them. You can't see out of them very well. They have those lovely louvers in the back window, a huge blind spot in the C-pillar. And if you put anything in the trunk, as I found out once when I had the good fortune to borrow one, for, a, for an afternoon, my deodorant melted and my toothpaste melted. It gets very, very hot in the trunk of these cars. Uh, not, the, not the most practical car, even among the Italian exotics, but what a car to look at. And uh, it, you know, it, 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 this car just says wow all yep. the way through. It does, and it's not the only car here in the Lifesaver colors. We're gonna go look at the fly yellow Ferrari Daytona and the Dutch Racing Orange Lotus Elite in a minute. Dutch Racing Orange, uh, that's really the name of the color? That really is. I mean, the orange came from the fact that it was, uh, that's the, the racing colors of the Netherlands, and uh, it was apparently owned or campaigned by somebody from Holland, and it's orange. It's a Dutch treat. Let's go. It's really hard to do a small car well from a design standpoint. Um, it's, this is a very, very pretty car, but when you're dealing with proportions like this, it's hard to make them look really graceful and, and well-proportioned, but they managed to do that really well with this car. Actually designed not by a professional stylist, but by Lotus's accountant, and in Peter Kerwan Taylor. And, uh, you know, the one car that he did was, was really kind of one for the age. It's a very pretty car. But the interesting thing is the value of these cars in the last uh, last few years. Absolutely. What we've seen is these things have just exploded in value. Yeah, they really have. I, you know, I remember thinking, boy, I really like an Elite. Thinking when they were, you know, that when they were twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars, thinking they'd be that really more or less forever. But you're right; they've pretty much exploded. They're over a hundred thousand dollars right now, and uh, you know, a lot What's of people. What's the estimate on this one? This one is estimated at 100 to 150, and I think you know I think that's a that's a very good estimate for this car. I think it uh, it's going to pull at least 100 thousand dollars, and maybe somewhere in the middle of that. And uh, as you said, the best car ever designed by an accountant. So uh, absolutely crunching the numbers on this one. Do you think it'll do 150? I don't think it'll do 150. I think it's going to split the difference between 100 and 150, and come in at around one one and a quarter. But you know who knows? I mean, this one has. There weren't that many options with these cars, but this one has the one that's very desirable. It's got the ZF gearbox rather right. than the, the BMC gearbox that most of them had. This one's a right-hand drive car, which you know isn't really ideal for a U.S. audience, but I I've got a feeling this one's going to go back to the UK. What do you think, Dave? Well, it could be uh, that it's bought by an extremely well-to-do mail carrier, so he can just, you know, stuff the mail in the mailboxes from the side of the car. But you're probably right. It'll probably go back to the UK. Ferrari Daytona, um, you know, kind of a car that was a game changer for Ferrari. Yeah. They built 1,400 of them, and that sounds like so few cars. Yeah. But Ferrari, at that time, this was a huge number. They were making cars in the couple hundred or 300, sometimes even 75 or 125 cars. So this was kind of their first mass production, production car, production yeah. car at 1,400. Exactly. A game changer for Ferrari in terms of production numbers, but in terms of a car that was really with the times or ahead of the times, that Lamborghini Mura really represented the future of supercars. Mm -hmm. Front engine cars were really sort of on the way out by then, and, and Lamborghini was really showing the way with mid engine cars with the Mura, but still, this was a really potent car back in the day. This was one of the fastest cars on, on the planet at 172 miles an hour, and had a pretty famous history with uh, Dan Gurney and Brock Yates, Dave. 
What yeah, was that all about? Yeah, can- Cannonball Car, and uh, this is one of the cars that we just saw the Cannonball Car not too long ago at uh, Amelia Island. It was a record-setting car, and it was, uh, you know, maybe the perfect choice. Yeah, Gurney and Yates set the Coast to Coast record. It was something like 35 hours and 31 minutes back in 1971. It's absolutely amazing. But this is really how I love to see a Daytona, and the iconic fly yellow color, Barani wire wheels, just a fantastic looking car. You know, and uh, and uh, there were two styles for the front end. There was the European style, yes. in other words, the headlights were under glass that was not legal in the United States at the time, under plexiglass. So they had uh, lift up, uh, yep. you know, like you'd see in a Corvette, a contemporary Corvette, lift up headlights yep. as well. This one has those lift up headlights. Um, not the thing to go by. Some people prefer the European look, some people prefer this look. It's chocolate and vanilla. Yeah. Uh, there's a reason to get both of them. Also, a reason to get a US spec car, a reason to get a European spec car. Uh, they came with things like a radio. They came with, you know, an AM, FM radio. They came with things like air conditioning, and in this case, it was starting to be air conditioning that worked. Yeah. Uh, better than a mouse, you know, blowing across a, a fan type of thing. Uh, fun cars, beautiful cars to look at, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is it's still a style that some people just don't love. Yeah, true. But it, it beautiful car to drive at speed. At Absolutely. low speeds, it makes a really compelling reason nope. not to join a gym. No power steering. Yeah. Armstrong steering in these yeah, cars. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and you really... A couple of them have been retrofitted with power steering, but uh, that's kind of the oddball. If you don't already have forearms like Popeye, drive a Daytona for a couple of years and you will. No spinach eaten. <laughs> All right, Dave, we saw a lot of cars early on before they crossed the block. We snuck into RM and uh, that's pretty much it. Anything to add? You know, we got a lot of stuff going on here. It's a big weekend. There's five auctions actually going on. There's all kinds of Concours, of course, wrapped up with uh, Pebble Beach. So. They said California is the place to be. That's certainly true for Rob and me. <laughs>